That's the real feeling you may be experiencing is intentional. It's real. Things are pretty fucked up right now. Things have been fucked up for a long time. While advancements in technology have made information more accessible, they have also made us more vulnerable to the spread of mis- and disinformation. Cutting through the narratives and trying to understand what's happening is overwhelming, seemingly by design. We are inundated with distorted facts and our reality is under constant attack by those in power, trolls, and sometimes even the people and things we love. Hello and welcome back to Animation Propaganda. Welcome to Series 2. It's good to be back. Now that we can ever truly leave this disinformation nightmare. For those unfamiliar with this series, we look at the intersection of animation and propaganda and how cartoons have been used to sway, influence, and control people. Every episode, we explore this relationship through several narratives centered around a theme. This series is going to be a little softer than the last, uh, less dead bodies, which I appreciate, a little more fun, uh, but hopefully no less interesting. To reiterate the warnings from last time, these videos will include disturbing and sometimes very offensive content. Please adhere to the content warnings and know that lighter stuff is going to be going up in addition to this. Feel free to set this one out. Also, the subject is inherently political. I am biased, I have my beliefs, but I will try not to be too obnoxious. And most importantly, please remember that it's still propaganda, even if you agree with it. We're going to be kicking things off with contraband cartoons or bootleg versions of popular animated personalities and how they have been appropriated to spread a political message. Some of these are things we missed last time, others we've treaded on in other videos, but we are going to be going a little deeper. We are also going to see how the evolution of media has aided the spread of propaganda. So yeah, yeah, let's get to it. The Second World War was the first global conflict where those fighting grew up on film. It was the dominant medium of the early 20th century, and the fantasies it projected informed the experience of those viewing it. This made it an extremely valuable propaganda tool, the most, arguably, up until social media. The stars of the screen held a great deal of influence over citizens, and with the outbreak of war, many joined the fight, including cartoon characters. Now in Episode 5, we covered the mobilizing of Disney properties, namely Donald Duck, as well as Warner characters and Popeye for the war effort. These tunes rallied for war bonds, or saw combat. <laughs> Some even killed Hitler, with one notable exception, Mickey Mouse. Mickey was arguably the biggest star in Hollywood throughout the 1930s. Walt Disney built his empire around him, and in the process made him a cultural icon, recognized the world over as American as apple pie. In short, Mickey was sacred, or considered too wholesome to go to war. He was off-limits for Disney animators, at least to see combat, but the same couldn't be said for Nazis. In 1944, the short Nimbus Libre was produced in occupied France. It intended to convince the French America was not their ally by showing popular cartoon characters bombing them. Included in the Blitz was Felix, Popeye, and an assortment of Disney characters. The short has its fair share of anti-Semitism as well, as it is framed around a Jewish caricature announcing the attack. A few years earlier, Mickey also appeared as the Harbinger of Death in the Japanese short Toy Box Series 3, Picture Book 1936. Uh, now, this was actually produced in 1934, technically making it retrofuturism. Here, Mickey represents American imperialism and Western decadence. While it predates Pearl Harbor, it resembles later Japanese propaganda, like Mamataro Sea Eagles, and that it features figures from Japanese folklore battling American forces in pop culture. Uh, honorable mention to Bluto's appearance there. These forces are represented by snakes, crocodiles, and a fleet of bat-riding Mickeys that terrorize a village of adorable animals from the skies, among them a bootleg felix. From a storybook comes Mamataro and other legends to wage war against the invaders, eventually banishing them. Uh, this short was obviously an indoctrination tool, portraying American pop culture not only as evil, but inferior to Japanese cultural icons. I find it very interesting how they demonize their enemy this way, portraying their culture as superior, rather than focusing on race, like so much American propaganda from that time aimed at Japan. However, not all those that appropriated Mickey were foreign enemies. During the height of the very divisive Vietnam War, animators turned to their medium for protest. As a quick side note, this period gave us Ward Kimball's amazing escalation. Uh, now Kimball was a very prominent Disney animator who produced the short independently. It features then-president Lyndon B. Johnson reciting the Battle Hymn of the Republic. As he does so, his nose grows, reminiscent of Pinocchio, uh, and a penis. <laughs> when fully erect, it explodes, and the sounds of explosions play over a collage of Americana. Now I read this as Kimball painting Johnson as a warmonger, fetishizing and perpetuating the war at the expense of the American people, a popular belief at the time as many opposed the US involvement in the war. Contributing factors uh, to this belief include the advent of television, bringing the war into the people's home every evening. This was also the first war post-civil rights movement, and voices that previously would have gone unheard now at a platform, highlighting the fact that the draft disproportionately affected working class and African Americans. Young people were being sent away to die, and the narratives emerging didn't match the ones of those in power. In 1968, Whitney Lee Savage, father of Mythbusters host Adam Savage, shipped Mickey to Vietnam. This crude short was considered lost for many years, but resurfaced in full in 2018. 
Like Escalation, it would not get widespread release, but was screened a lot at universities. Uh, in it, Mickey is convinced to join the military by a recruitment poster, sails over, and is met with a bullet to the head. On August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, a move widely condemned by the international community. In response, the largest coalition of military forces since World War II was assembled to expel Iraqi forces from the area, led by America. The resulting conflict became known as the Gulf War, or Operation Desert Storm. Like Vietnam, the Gulf War was televised with one major difference. It was followed live 24-7. CNN and the 24-hour news cycle presented war non-stop and brought viewers to the battlefield in real time. To maintain viewership and interest, and to maximize ad revenue, coverage became more sensational and appealed to emotion rather than simply delivering facts. For the first time, technology allowed viewers to follow missiles to their targets, and war was framed as though it were episodic television, as it happened. At the same time, an animated sitcom was taking America by storm. Created by cartoonist Matt Groening, The Simpsons featured the misadventures of a dysfunctional family, with its breakout star being the young troublemaker, Bart. The Simpsons became a pop culture phenomenon and was even referenced by then-president George H.W. Bush as an example of a bad family, despite I'm sure many identifying with that portrayal over, say, the Waltons. It also launched a massive merchandise blitz. Bart Simpson was everywhere and on everything, from video games to alarm clocks. Due to its popularity, The Simpsons also spawned its fair share of unlicensed merchandise, the most prominent being Bootleg Bart. Now, Bootleg Bart has been covered elsewhere on this channel, but this was the unauthorized use of Bart on novelty t-shirts. These were crude, with many making political statements. We were in the midst of the AIDS crisis, and some spread positive messages, like wear a condom, while others took a much more negative route. While the most popular iteration of Bart was Black Bart, which highlighted systematic racism and carried messages that are still painfully relevant today, the most bizarre subset was Gulf War Bart. Obviously, the appropriation of Bart for the purpose of promoting the Gulf War. They feature Bart in Desert Storm settings with many allusions to oil, Saddam Hussein, and weapons of mass destruction. As someone with an affinity for The Simpsons, I admit this can be very jarring, but it very much foreshadows our next topic. It's not an exaggeration to say cartoons are currently on the front line of the culture war. Social media has emerged as a seemingly unstoppable force for spreading propaganda, and messages move like wildfire, whether agreed with or not. A great example of this, protests with ridiculous signs or slogans, you know, words misspelled that are then shared mockingly, but the message still gets through. More people are exposed to it, and just because many have the ability to see through it doesn't mean everyone does. Exposure can help foster or propagate these beliefs in those already susceptible or vulnerable to the message. In short, Mockingly spreading propaganda is still spreading propaganda. Obviously, fake news sources are rampant, but far more accessible and fun are memes, dank memes. This was a word and concept coined by Richard Dawkins in 1976. Dawkins used it to describe the transfer of information from person to person, like a behavior or a belief. With the rise of the internet, it's taking a similar meaning and is now used to describe viral media. Early and far more wholesome examples include All Your Base Are Belong to Us, which grew out of the poor localization of the video game Zero Wing, and Rick Rolling, or tricking someone into listening to the song Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley. My, how times have changed. As social media and the internet as a whole evolved, so did memes, with lol cats emerging as the most influential. These paired pictures of cats with text, usually something funny or cute. This format, pairing images with text, known as an image macro, became super popular, and memes grew beyond cats to include other animals, celebrities, or just regular people. It's no surprise that unlicensed and unofficial usage of cartoon characters has also taken off, the most popular of these probably being SpongeBob SquarePants, obviously hugely nostalgic for many who grew up on the internet. Seeing how quickly they are embraced and their incredible ability to spread, it's also not shocking memes have become an excellent medium for spreading propaganda. Putting these two together can be very effective. Cartoon characters appear in memes that appeal to all points of the political spectrum. Playing off of nostalgia or interest, beloved cartoon characters are combined with conspiracy theories or divisive political messages, like Squidward telling you there's only two genders, and their association make these messages more approachable. They can reach children or those simply wanting to enjoy a fandom. Fan groups get spammed with these memes all the time, which can lead to desensitization and even recruitment as they typically target disenfranchised young men, which, you know, let's be honest, these fans are full of, with the hope of radicalizing them. Now these can be made and sent from some edgy kid in their parents' basement or as part of a massive calculated disinformation campaign by a lobby group or government. In this day and age, you never really know. However, they can be shared by everybody, effectively converting our friends and loved ones into propaganda agents. In our next video, we will look at propaganda in peacetime, advertising, and how cartoons have been used to sell products. Now, it is not lost on me that featuring these pieces of propaganda also spreads their message, but I hope my attempt to inform can be useful in identifying and curbing the spread of these messages. And uh, hey, 
If what's happening in the world right now is putting you in a pessimistic mood, there are ways you can show your solidarity and support from a distance. I will post a link in the description to resources for organizations and non-monetary ways you can help those facing and fighting police brutality and systematic racism. Uh, we donated. It's addicting, so please consider if you have the means to. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here, and be sure to get caught up on the series if you missed it. Uh, plenty of good stuff there. As always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel, and thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there.